Well, I'm not uh, going to give the same keynote. Uh, I want to make that absolutely clear. I'm actually going to uh, present to you a paper that I also presented at uh, the <coughs> Dutch-Flemish-German CAA conference, uh, which was held in, uh, in Ghent uh, last November. So the people who were there, well, I'm sorry, I'm going to tell you exactly the same thing, but yeah, this is a last minute uh, solution. Okay, <coughs> well, the title is Integrating Detection and Modeling of Ancient Pathways. Uh, basically, uh, what I want to tell you a little bit about is, uh, yeah, first of all, why do we actually uh, study pathways? But basically to yeah, show you a little bit what is going on in the moment at the moment in both the detection of ancient pathways and routes and the modeling of those same pathways and routes. Um, we sort of uh, uh, yeah we sort of realized that these worlds are actually quite separate uh, there are people actually looking at how you can how you can find these things also using lots of uh, new remote sensing techniques and there are other people trying to reconstruct those roads on the basis of models and uh, yeah it seemed to be quite difficult to actually connect those two uh, those two things and yeah our uh, tentative uh, explanation for this was that this had to do with the actual way in which uh, scientists have looked at paths uh, especially where it concerns the kind of terminolo terminology and definitions they are using so yeah that's basically uh, what uh, I would like to share with you today so well for the audience here it will be probably very fairly obvious uh, why you would like to want to, to study these uh, these pathways uh, in the past we've seen a lot of settlement pattern studies uh, coming along over the past uh, past few few days and uh, yeah, they, so these are basically focusing on the places where people lived, but obviously all these places had connections. People were moving from one place to the other, and they were transporting stuff from one place to the other. So these pathways are essentially uh, as important uh, as the settlements uh, themselves in terms of shaping, uh, yeah, basically uh, a society. And it also means that uh, pathways leave material traces on the ground, and they also have what you might say life histories just like settlements have so they ha they change through time they change position they change function and uh, yeah in that sense they are probably equally interesting but they have their specific problem in the sense that they are more difficult to detect and it also looks like they might be more variable than settlements so this is a major reason why modeling has been used uh, quite often to try to predict and reconstruct these pathways. Uh, so we are not as reliant on uh, actual data sets as we are with settlement studies. Uh, now, even while this detection is uh, quite challenging, uh, we can see that there are currently a few trends in uh, detection that, uh, yeah, that are sort of changing the game slowly. There is a long tradition of using uh, aerial photography and also historical mapping uh, to try to find traces of old uh, roads and routes. And yeah, usually these, uh, these work only to a certain extent. Um, now, what you have seen happening uh, over the past 10 years is that uh, especially LiDAR as a data source has become increasingly important for detection of all kinds of archaeological sites. But one of the categories that actually has uh, been extremely interesting to look at is the category of roads. And why is this? Because we are dealing with elements that are usually characterized by quite subtle uh, elevation differences but that also have quite uh, a large extent. So this is typically the kind of stuff that you can detect from, uh, from a LiDAR detailed elevation uh, image. Uh, however, we also see that uh, in LiDAR in general, uh, the, uh, the issue of actually covering large areas is becoming problematic because you need to use uh, yeah, visual detection to actually uh, find stuff. And that takes a lot of time, and it also runs a little bit uh, the danger of being incomparable between one observer and the other. So there is some work being done right now, among others at University Leiden, uh, on 
automated or semi-automated detection of not just roads but all kinds of other uh, elements in LiDAR. Um, so, uh, this is happening at the moment, but it also seems that uh, yeah, there is still a lack of uh, yeah, idea about what we are actually seeing in the LiDAR and how we need to describe this. So this is why I noticed the lack of ontology here. And <coughs> yeah, the idea how to, uh, how, to do th how to interpret what we detect uh, yeah, actually means that we need to connect these, uh, uh, these LiDAR images much more to other sources of information and to interpret the frameworks uh, than we have done uh, in the past. If you look at the other side, <coughs> the modeling side, uh, yeah, people have been working on uh, trying to uh, reconstruct roads using cost services, least cost pass modeling, and accessibility mapping. That has come in a lot of flavors, actually. Uh, there have been uh, publications on movement potential of landscape. There have been uh, attempts to sort of define mobility basins of uh, yeah, areas in the landscape, uh, sort of attracting movement. Other people have looked more at uh, corridors of movement uh, where movement could have taken place and yeah, others have looked at the uh, potential of actually uh, uh, connections existing between either known uh, places or even between random locations in the, la in, in the landscape. Uh, so there's lots of possible uh, approaches that you can use, uh, but there are some issues with it, uh, especially where it comes to the uh, yeah, kind of sensitivity analysis of these modeling. What is actually happening uh, when you are modeling and uh, what are the actual results coming out of there uh, in terms of uh, yeah, in terms of reliability, perhaps, or in terms of uh, variability. So we're talking about, yeah, basically error margins of the models themselves without even going into the issue of the actual accuracy of the models as reconstructions of routes or pathways. So there's a lot of technical stuff there that uh, yeah, is being addressed but still needs to be uh, pushed further, I think. Uh, what we also see happening recently is that people are trying to integrate these uh, least cost pass models with network analysis and to a lesser extent with agent-based modeling yeah, to better understand uh, yeah, how movements in the landscape actually took place than just looking at the pathways themselves as sort of static, uh, static structures. Um, yeah, but I think when we looked at this we thought, well, maybe we should step back a little bit and think uh, about how we actually define these pathways. Um, this was uh, inspired actually by this book here, Landscape of Movement, uh, that was published in 2009, which is very interesting to read because on the one hand it offers a lot of information on, yeah, uh, on pathways or movements in the past, and on the other hand uh, completely ignores any kind of modeling. So this is published by people who have a lot of knowledge about uh, about these things, but who were completely unaware of the possibilities that would be offered by, offered by digital techniques. And in chapter 12, uh, Timothy Earle uh, presents basically a sort of uh, definition of yeah, paths, trails, roads, uh, how you could actually define these uh, in a way that they could be studied uh, profitably in archaeology. So. His idea is basically that you have uh, different uh, yeah, intensities of movement, I would say. So a path is something that is, uh, that is existing locally, that doesn't have a lot of, uh, lot of construction going on. If, uh, yeah, if they are there, they are relatively difficult also uh, to detect. Uh, yeah, usually there is very little trace left. So these are, say, the difficult, uh, the difficult elements what we, that we're talking about, and yeah, these are still things that are there in the landscape. So they would be st the kind of stuff that would be really uh, more suitable for modeling than for uh, remote sensing detection. Then if you m move up uh, to the next level, you would come to something that you could call a trail, that is basically a regional or a long-distance route that uh, yeah, might even be uh, partly constructed and that would be really recognizable uh, uh, 
at the time and that would also for example have markers because they would connect uh, from one place uh, to the other so it would not be something that people would know automatically uh, when they would uh, when they would move over there um, again the uh, construction site is uh, uh, making this a little bit more difficult to uh, to detect them at times, although there are also situations where you can find these trails quite well because of erosion of the of the of the actual trail itself. And uh, yeah, these are also things that uh, people have been very interested in in modeling. Uh, I think most studies in least cost path modeling are actually concentrating on this kind of scale of regional uh, to long distance that doesn't leave a lot of traces in the landscape, uh, but still enough to, uh, yeah, to, to make a sort of uh, reasoned claim on where these things uh, were. And then at the highest level we will find uh, yeah, something that we call a road, something that is really constructed, that uh, is usually also uh, uh, built by yeah, uh, a society that has a larger degree of organization. And these are actually the ones that attract most interest, I would say, from uh, yeah, ar field archaeologists, because these are the things that they tend to study, Yeah, because you find lots of stuff there and they are uh, easy to document and you, ca yeah, you have more information. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there's also for the modeling, there is some perspective in there. There have been quite a few uh, papers on uh, Roman roads, bu built roads that have been partially destroyed and you're trying to connect these together. Um, the one thing that uh, Timothy Earl didn't include were waterways, uh, one that is really important as well, I think, to understand local uh, transport and mobility. And I think these are quite challenging from both sides, both from the detection side. I mean, yeah, what are you going to find underwater? Yeah, maybe some sh sunken ships. And you can find maybe the places where people took to the water and also for modeling, uh, yeah, it's kind of challenging because, uh, yeah, uh, water offers completely different kind of constraints than the land does. So if you then look at, say, these, this terminology and you try to place different publications in there, then you can see here in, uh, in red the modeling papers, uh, which are basically more concentrated on the longer distance uh, scale um, and then the detection is much more focusing on the scale of the yeah of the local connection so there is a kind of uh, discrepancy between the two that uh, yeah do, that we could think about how to how to improve that and then obviously if you have roads then you should also think about uh, moving upwards and try to understand the actual networks so you can start at a very local level at yeah, what Dimitri always calls a mesh work, so a an, yeah, sort of messy uh, system of paths that connect to local fields and that don't yeah, that vary quite a lot in time as well, to a more stable network of communication that goes from one place uh, to the other, to the even probably more stable big road systems that are usually linked to military and political frames and these yeah these are actually interconnected uh, which is a question that very few people have uh, have tried to address i think and then the question is of course uh, well when does connectivity originate and how is it actually maintained over time um again uh yeah looking at the descriptions that uh, that earl uh, described he also says well there are certain aspects in road that you could uh, that you could study that you could uh, use to uh, to define them uh, so he n he notes uh, eight variables here like uh, the amount of construction what kind of technology that people use to move characteristics of the terrain uh, places where people went to uh, if they have any kind of uh, specific function then also looking at the network organization itself, the scale I already mentioned, and perhaps is there also some kind of uh, more, uh, yeah, uh, more abstract meaning. Um, I think that uh, yeah, the things that are uh, presented here in D uh, are the kind of things that you can uh, approach by detecting them, and the kinds in M are probably the kind of things that you can approach by modeling. So you see also here that these things are not completely compatible and uh, yeah, that you need to take 
uh, these both in account if you want to yeah, actually have a more coherent vision of, uh, of the road networks. So, talking about yeah, potentially bridging gaps, um, what we should look at and is probably also the practices of movement themselves. Uh, so, yeah, what actually drove people to, uh, to move? Why did they go from one place to the other? Um, if you create a model, uh, then usually you depart from, say, one kind of goal-oriented uh, movement. So it will only give you a model for one specific kind of practice. Whereas if you look at stuff that you detect from the LiDAR, you will get a full palimpsest and you will not have much idea about yeah, what kind of uh, practice you are actually looking at. So that's one thing that uh, could be interesting uh, to combine these two, to say, okay, well, I can actually use the modeling to look at the practices, and then maybe I can better interpret what is found on the LiDAR. Uh, yeah, the other thing, of course, is uh, the environmental context. Uh, the uh, possibilities for detection are very much uh, governed by uh, what is in the landscape. Uh, so LiDAR, even with all its advantages, is not going to solve uh, every issue for us. So there, the modeling needs to be, uh, yeah, needs to be used to actually try to bridge these gaps and say, okay, well, there are areas where we possibly can't get a lot of information, but at least we can try to make a reasoned guess about where things uh, were. The other thing that uh, yeah, we should really be looking as, as at is the historical trajectory. I think uh, yeah, today and yesterday we also s uh, saw that this is an important element when looking at settlement patterns, but it's equally important when looking at, uh, at road and transport networks. And obviously also because the creation of pathways and roads might also uh, lead to the creation of new settlement to uh, other types of land use and this yeah this constant interplay between uh, movement and uh, settlements and land use is something that we can yeah do quite a lot more with I, I would say and then finally of course uh, yeah the confrontation of theory to data um, there are uh, I think uh, methods to do that and some people have experimented with it uh, over the past few years as well uh, also uh, Rowan who is sitting in the back uh, has tried to uh, to see uh, how you can actually, on the one hand, model and then look at what comes from LiDAR data and how to say something about the validity of the modeling. But yeah, there is also still a lot of work uh, to be done there. So basically, uh, where we'd like to end up with is, in a sense, uh, a sort of ontology of pathways that, on the one hand, we can understand better in terms of basic morphology what roads, paths, trails look like uh, on the ground uh, and when you see them uh, reflected in, uh, in LiDAR, but also when you're looking at field survey and uh, that kind of stuff. So they have these kind of characteristics that we need to better understand. And on the other hand, we need to better understand what is the trajectory of such a road and uh, yeah, its life history that has to do with the uses that people made of it and how it has changed through time. Through time. Okay. So, we need some improvements in the definition of pathways in terms of scale development connectivity. It is more than morphology, which has been a lot of, uh, yeah, much of the attention in detection, I think. Uh, also the understanding of movement practices and what it actually leaves in terms of material traces is something that we uh, should look into in more detail and also into uh, the actual accuracy of what we see and what we model is something that we need to, uh, to think about as well. So we are actually organizing a uh, session in Atlanta at CA. I don't think many people will come there, but we will try to address these issues over there. So there will be something more coming out and hopefully also a bigger paper to be published on this issue uh, later this year. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs>